Good morning, <laughs> and thanks for coming. My name is Marty Kaplan. I'm on the faculty at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California. I'm also the founding director of something called the Norman Lear Center, whose uh, mission is to study and to shape the impact of entertainment and media on society. Uh, if you're interested in the Lear Center's work, learcenter.org uh, is the conclusion <coughs> of my branding message. Um, uh, today is the second of uh, a series of four events here at AHA. Uh, it's the launch of a partnership uh, whose members are the National History Center of the AHA. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Roger Lewis and Jim Grossman for uh, being part of initiating this partnership. Uh, the Lear Center and also uh, at USC, the Center for Communication, Leadership and Policy, which is uh, headed up by uh, my colleague Jeffrey Cowan. Um, that partnership uh, has a name. It's called Historians, Journalists, and the Challenges of Getting It Right. And uh, it starts with the uh, premise that both those professions, historians and journalists, are in the business of finding and assessing evidence, uh, of analyzing events, and of narrating events. They're both storytellers. Both, uh, we think, could enhance their work by learning from each other, by establishing networks that connect them, by sharing expertise, and by sharing practical knowledge about media and methods. So we begin that collaboration here, and it's also my privilege as part of that to ask you to turn off your cell phones. C-SPAN is with us, uh, we're, we're glad of that. The amplification here uh, is our own voices, not these microphones, so later on when uh, there's time for questions uh, from uh, the room, Please uh, uh, speak into the mic, but know that for the people here, your voice uh, is not amplified. Um, and so in order to explore what these professions have in common and where they differ, to begin to understand what each of those professions means by getting it right, to examine the impact of journalism on history and history on journalism, we have these four case studies uh, here at uh, uh, AHA. And the first one yesterday was uh, about American biography and the Cold War, biography of uh, Lillian Hellman that uh, Alice Kessler Harris of Columbia uh, spoke about. Uh, later today, there will be a session on interpreting the Arab Spring with uh, Juan Cole of Michigan. Uh, and then on American intervention with uh, Jeremy Suri at uh, uh, UT Austin. This morning, our topic is publishing and the American century. Our format is a little unusual for uh, this annual conference. We will have a presenter, but then instead of serial comments, we will instead have a more freewheeling, informal conversation among everyone uh, who is here. I'll introduce the members of the panel later on. Uh, right now, I'd like to introduce uh, our presenter. Um, uh, Alan Brinkley is the Alan Nevins Professor of American History at Columbia. Uh, among his works are Voices of Protest, Huey Long, Father Coughlin, and the Great Depression, which won the National Book Award for History. Uh, the Unfinished Nation, The End of Reform are uh, two other of his works, and uh, the book we're focusing on today, and uh, though he didn't ask me to, I'm happy to hold up a hardbound <laughs> copy, which is still available, uh, is the publisher, Henry Luce and His American Century. Please join me in welcoming Alan Brink. Thank you, Marty. Um, <clears throat> the uh, title of this uh, session, Historians, Journalists, and the Challenges of Getting It Right, uh, is very apt for a talk about Henry Luce, uh, because getting it right was not always uh, 
something that Henry Luce did. Um, but I, I, I want to, first of all, I want to thank uh, Roger Lewis for organizing this sen session, and I'm very grateful to uh, Jackson Lears and Michael Kazin and Rick Perlstein uh, and Marty Kaplan for joining this conversation about historians and journalists. Uh, I've been asked to speak about Henry Luce, which I'm glad to do. I think, though, that we should not consider this a discussion just about Luce, but also, I, I, although I do think uh, that Luce is a useful model for understanding how journalism can shape history and vice versa. Henry Luce was one of the most powerful and influential journalists of the mid 20th century. He was the co founder of Time Magazine in 1923, the creator of Fortune Magazine in 1930, Life Magazine in 1936. Uh, and in and quite incongruently, uh, Sports Illustrated in 1954, uh, incongruent uh, because he knew so little about sports that he had to ask some of his employees to take him to Yankee Stadium to explain baseball to him. As a publisher and editor, uh, he sought throughout his life to bring the nation. Uh, and much of the world into an age of consensual progress on the Western model. He never succeeded in this mission, but he never abandoned the effort. Henry Robinson Luce uh, was the son of a Presbyterian missionary in China. <coughs> he lived in various missionary compounds in Hunan for the first 13 years of his life. Missionary life in China could be difficult and dangerous. The Luce family had to flee to Korea one night to escape the Boxer Rebellion when Harry was two years old. But for the most part, missionary families experienced a life of community and commitment. Henry Winters Luce, uh, Harry's father, was a Yale graduate uh, who was drawn into the student volunteer movement of the late 19th century, which drew many young educated men to the missionary life. Uh, Henry Winters Luce sought to bring Christianity to China, something that the missionary movement conspicuously failed to do. But the senior Henry Luce was also committed to bringing modern Western education and knowledge to the Chinese people, and in that he was somewhat more successful. The younger Harry Luce became in many ways a missionary too a revolutionary figure who believed that he could shape the world through journalism, just as his father believed he could shape the world through faith. But he was an unlikely revolutionary in many ways. He attended Hotchkiss. He became a skull and bonesman, bonesman at Yale. And eventually, he became one of the wealthiest men in America. Uh, he lived accordingly. He divorced his loyal, but in his view, dull first wife and married one of the most famous, ambitious, and controversial women of the mid-20th century, Claire Booth Luce, journalist, editor, playwright, member of Congress, ambassador to Italy. Their marriage was a romantic disaster, <laughs> but it survived in part because of the fame that it helped create for both of them. They would, he once wrote to Claire, uh, that they would be the Luces the Magnificent, which seemed at times to compensate for the coldness and <coughs> frequent apartness of their marriage. He disliked most of the New Deal, and he loathed Franklin Roosevelt. He said after Franklin Roosevelt's death, it is my duty to go on hating him. His famous 1941 essay in Life, the, the American Century, perhaps the most famous uh, essay that he ever wrote, was a call to reshape the world on the American model. Uh, he wrote, we are the inheritors of all the great principles of Western civilization, above all justice, the love of truth, the ideal of charity. It now becomes our time to be the powerhouse from which the ideals spread throughout the world and do their mysterious work of lifting the life of mankind from the level of the beasts to what the psalmist called a little lower than the angels. Luce had an almost proprietary view of China, the land of his birth, and he spent much of his adult life supporting and idolizing Chiang Kai-shek, denying the undeniable corruption and incompetence of the Kuomintang <coughs> regime 
and insisting that the United States commit itself to defeating the Japanese and then the communists in China. One of his most famous journalists, Theodore H. White, then a young time correspondent in China and for a time a friend and admirer of Luce, White was peremptorily fired when he began to express his disaffection with Shang. Partly as a result of Luce's grief over the fall of China, he went on to be a passionate champion of America's least popular and least successful wars. If he had had his way, the United States would have used both the Korean War and the Vietnam War uh, as conflicts that would help <coughs> unleash Chiang Kai-shek and join him in overthrowing the communist regime in China. And he believed in that until his death. Luce was a difficult man with few friends, an unhappy marriage, and a kind of shyness linked with arrogance that left him mostly alone. Alone, but certainly not invisible. His hand was evident in almost every aspect of Time Incorporated's, li Incorporated's life and culture. The company attracted talented young men uh, from the Ivy League, almost never women, men who aspired to be novelists or poets or playwrights, but who wrote for Time because they needed a salary, and no one paid better than Luce. But the regimented world of Time Incorporated was stifling. Uh, to many of its writers. Many of them left over time to do more creative and in independent work, but others stayed on for decades, often hating the work, but unwilling to give up the lucrative salaries and lavish expense accounts. What made Luce a revolutionary figure, I think, uh, in American life, was not his politics or his religion or even his missionary zeal. It was his success in creating a new era of communications that had an enormous impact on the culture of the 20th century. At the precocious age of 24, Luce and his brilliant classmate, friend, partner, and rival, Britton Haddon, created the first news magazine, uh, a new word that they invented themselves. Time itself was also something new, a concise summary of the news of the world published weekly and marketed throughout the United States and later around the world. The magazine was not to everyone's taste with its deliberately idiosyncratic language and its sometimes arch opinions, but for the hundreds of thousands and eventually millions of readers, Time was among the first publications that made the news of the world available to people in all parts of the nation. Time was designed to be a kind of glue, providing professional and other middle-class people with a common, reliable, and concise guide to information that was now more important to them than ever before. In Sinclair Lewis's 1922 novel, Babbitt, uh, just one year before the emergence of Time magazine, the title character spoke triumphantly of what he called the same standardization of stores, offices, streets, hotels, and newspapers throughout the United States, which illustrated, he said, how strong and enduring a type is ours. To Sinclair Lewis, this standardization was a mark of society's <coughs> arid consumerism. But to Luce and to most middle-class Americans, these changes represented progress the creation of a market for a national news magazine that would bring the news of the world every week in a concise way to help busy people inform themselves quickly. Patton died prematurely of a strep infection in 1929, a few days after his 31st birthday. Luce moved forward with his own vision without looking back. In 1930, the early months of the Great Depression, he launched the first truly serious business magazine in America, Fortune, a dazzlingly beautiful monthly, des monthly designed uh, to examine business and capitalism in a way that would provide knowledge about the workings of the economy, which he believed that all Americans, not just businessmen, should understand. He hired talented writers, some of whom went on to great literary careers, who examined and explained areas of business that were largely new to them and to their readers. He recruited talented photographers, among them Margaret Burke White, and he recruited talented writers with little experience in, in business. Among these writers, for fortune, 
were James Agee, Dwight McDonald, Archer, Ar Archibald McLeish, and Ralph Ingersoll. For a time, Fortune was a lively, literate, serious, and path-breaking magazine in a field that had previously been largely celebratory. Six years later, Luce published the first issue of Life, perhaps the most popular magazine ever published in America. It was not the first picture magazine in the new age of photography, but it was by far the most creative and successful, offering a visual image of its time and revealing, as Luce wrote in his famous perspective, the faces of the poor and the gestures of the proud, strange things, machines, armies, multitudes, shadows in the, in the jungle and on the moon, things hidden behind walls and within rooms, things dangerous to come to. It too, life, became a magnet for many, perhaps most of the leading photographers of its time, although some of the best of them, uh, like the writers, jumped ship after a few years to escape what they considered the sometimes stifling discipline that shadowed all of the loose magazines. Luce launched other innovations as well, uh, the March of Time, the first newsreels to offer documentary features, not just headlines and beauty pageants. It won a special act, uh, um, Academy Award for its creativity through the help of his powerful friend, David Selznick. There was also a weekly national radio program drawn from time, and in 1954, he launched Sports Illustrated. Like Fortune, it relied not only on good photographers, but also on good writers, among them William Faulkner, A.J. Liebling, Wallace Stegner, Bud Schulberg, and John Steinbeck. Luce insisted that it should elevate the worlds of sports uh, from, being not, from being just a game to being a metaphor for the human condition. The Time, Inc. publications were extraordinarily expensive to publish and distribute, but Luce resisted economi economizing uh, and believed <coughs> that spending more money to create greater quality was the best strategy for success and they moved ahead uh, in what they knew was a dangerously expensive gamble on the magazines, uh, acting, one of them said, in an atmosphere of complete and serene confidence to grasp the chance of a lifetime. From the mid-30s through the late 50s, Time Incorporated was one of the largest news organizations in the world, with bureaus on every continent and with reporters active in most nations. The company claimed to reach over 20 million people every week, and many more during World War II, which the Time, Inc. magazines reported at least as intensely as any other organization. Time, Inc.'s great success was partly a result of shrewd management and lavish but careful budgeting, but it was also a result of Luce himself, who had looked into the future and had seen an increasingly integrated nation bound together by railroads, highways, radio, movies, and the rise of a national corporate culture. As a result, he believed Amer Americans would need a vast amount of information, more than ever, and an efficient way of accessing it. And he embraced, Luce embraced that future and created vehicles that served the needs of his rapidly changing time. By the time of Luce's retirement, in 1964, three years before his death, his empire was beginning to show its age. Time Incorporated was still thriving, but it was rivaled by television and by countless newer magazines that competed effectively with him. His colleagues prodded him to move into television and to branch out into other areas, but Luce, who was no longer the wrestler pioneer that he once had been, resisted diversification in his last years and tried instead to protect what he had already created. Life ceased to be profitable in the late 1950s and finally ceased publication in 1972, five years after Luce's death. Time, Fortune, and Sports Illustrated uh, have survived and have reinvented themselves repeatedly as the publishing world has changed, but all of them uh, have deteriorated over time. Luce was a man in search of vehicles of change, at, at least in the uh, heyday of his time, 
and the magazines he created were breakthroughs in the history of journalism. Time was the first and most successful news magazine. Fortune reinvented the business journal. Life turned photographs into a powerful tool of journalism. He had no fear of the new, and he welcomed it through most of his life. Modern art, which he had once loathed, uh, but, began, but eventually uh, began to collect. Modern technology, modern design. He bought an architecture magazine in the 1930s because he saw in it a chronicle of modernism and, commission, and commissioned the modernist Edward Durrell Stone to build a house for him in South Carolina. And modern business. He was always attracted to the most creative and progressive business leaders and considered himself one of them. For all his political conservatism on many issues, he was <coughs> a man in search of the future. For decades, decades, Luce had worked to portray and shape America as a united common culture. Despite differences in class or race or region, Americans, he believed, shared a basic set of values that transcended diversity. At one point in the 1950s, he brightly entitled an article in Life, Nobody is Mad at Nobody. Luce's optimism represented his admiration for Eisenhower and what he considered his impact on the nation, but his optimism went beyond his confidence in the president. In the 1950s, he was at the height of his belief that there was a broadly shared vision of what American meant and that his publications could help cement that consensual vision of the nation. There was, of course, never a universally shared vision of America, no matter how much Lewis liked to think otherwise, but he believed it until the end of his life. He lived long enough through the 60s to see the beginning of the great fragmentation and polarization that should have destroyed his own assumptions about the future of the United States. But he never lost his confidence, as was clear in an unfinished memoir that he was writing in 1967, <coughs> the last year of his life. And he wrote, the United States was dedicated to a proposition. That was something unique in the history of nations. What is necessary to understand here is that the American proposition contains indeed, it's, uh, indeed is founded on, truths or hypotheses which are unqualifiedly universal. It was and is the American task to take the lead in creating a new form of world order. These were the ideas that ran throughout his life and in his last days, he was struggling them still. Thank you, Alan. And uh, uh, it's, the work is not only a brilliant piece of scholarship, it is an amazing uh, story and told in a, in a riveting way. And for those of you who have not plunked down the amount to purchase it, I warmly recommend it. Um, Alan uh, invited us to use the story of Luce and his American century as a springboard, uh, not just as uh, the exclusive focus of our conversation, and that's what we're going to do. And I'd like to introduce now the other members of the conversation, and once I've introduced all of them, uh, uh, let's welcome them. Uh, on my uh, extreme left, although perhaps not really, uh, is uh, Michael Kazin, a professor <laughs> of history at Georgetown, and he's also the co-editor of Dissent. His uh, focus, the focus of his work is uh, American politics and social movements. Among his works are The Populist Persuasion and American History, a Godly Hero, The Life of William Jennings Bryan, uh, co-authored with Morris Isserman of America Divided, The Civil War of the 1960s, and his newest book, American Dreamers, How the Left Changed a Nation. Uh, next to him is uh, Jackson Lears, a professor of history at Rutgers and editor-in-chief of Raritan. 
uh, U.S. cultural and intellectual history uh, has had his focus. Among his works, No Place of Grace, Anti-Modernism and the Transformation of American Culture, 1880 to 1920. That book was uh, released in 1981. It was reissued, which, uh, as you know, is something of a triumph, in 1994. And the Japanese translation just came out last year. Uh, also, Fables of Abundance, A Cultural History of Advertising, Something for Nothing, Luck in America, and his latest, Rebirth of a Nation, The Making of Modern America, 1877 to 1920. And then Rick Perlstein. Rick is a, a journalist and a historian. His uh, books uh, include uh, Before the Storm, Barry Goldwater, and the Unmaking of the American Consensus, Nixonland, The Rise of a President, and the Fracturing of America, which became a New York Times bestseller. And uh, to complete the triumvirate of uh, Goldwater and Nixon, uh, he's now at work on a book about uh, Ronald Reagan uh, called The Invisible Bridge. Uh, and his, his books have received glowing reviews from people both on the left and on the right, which is uh, quite unusual, especially in uh, third rail material like his. Uh, he's been uh, chief political correspondent for The Village Voice, and uh, uh, his uh, essays and articles and reviews have appeared in places like The New Republic, Slate, The New York Times, Washington Post, and many others. Uh, Rick, in some ways, is our journalist slash historian on the, on the panel, although everyone else here uh, has also written in uh, uh, what we might uh, call journalistic uh, uh, venues. And so uh, there's no particular cubbyhole that anyone uh, is in. So I would ask you please to join me in welcoming the panel. So I'd like to start by uh, asking the question, and I'll ask it uh, many different ways, uh, of what is journalism? Um, we've heard uh, a version of what Henry Luce thought journalism should be. Alan described it as glue or cement, and there's certainly an aspect of advocacy involved given what it was that Luce thought that common culture was, that he wanted to be sure that everyone understood and subscribed to. So uh, what is journalism? What are its purposes? <clears throat> what do journalists do? Who are journalists? And what does getting it, me getting it right mean for a journalist? That's, that's the place where I'd like to begin, and, and, and we'll see uh, where we go. And, and so uh, uh, let me just start by asking each of you, perhaps, to talk about that. And Michael, why don't uh, you take a whack at it? Like asking, what is reality? <laughs> um, if I could, let me you know, sort of get at it a little different way. I'm not sure I can um, rise to the epistemological level of, of uh, that question. Um, the heights. Um, I'm thinking about this panel, thinking a lot about um, you know how journalism and history are different because uh, historians argue about this all the time, and and you know we we know of course that. Uh, Many, perhaps most, of the most popular works of history are written by journalists. Um, Taylor Branch and, and uh, people like that. Rick, uh, for example, um, uh, David Marinus, uh, many other people. Um, and we think of vivid writing uh, in history often as journalistic writing, uh, which I think is is, is a shame. But you know, to my mind, you know, um, journalism. When journalists turn their um, attention to writing history. They do it with an eye to personality. They do it to an eye uh, for dramatic narrative. Um, and in some ways, uh, the kind of history that people prize is romantic history, I think. And there's a deep uh, tradition of that, of course, in American history, not just among journalists, but going back to George Bancroft and some of the earliest um, American historians. Whom you have written about. about. Uh, not about George, no. <laughs> not myself, no. But, and so I think um, you know, one of the problems, as we know, for historians is is uh, who are mostly academic historians, like most of the people uh, in this room and uh, um, one of the people on this panel, um, is how to uh, 
retain the, uh, the vivacity, uh, the color, the, the romance, I think, of, of history, and yet also write history which is uh, deeply analytical. And, and that's something which, my mind, I learned actually uh, a little bit from reading Time and Life when I was, uh, when I was a kid, believe it or not. Uh, I won't go on very long here, but basically, uh, for me, reading Time and Life, which came into the house every week, and my, my mother worked at Time and Life building, so we got the, the issues early uh, before other people did, um, was sort of a window into how history was about everything, you know, not just about politics, not just about about diplomacy or war, which is what I learned in my history classes in high school. It, it was about sports, it was about uh, high culture, it was about low culture, it was about art, uh, because uh, time and life were all about these things. And so there was a vividness there, which I, unconsciously at the time, wanted to bring into the history that I, I later on wanted to write. So for me, time and life were a tremendous goad, if you will, to writing uh, better history. Jackson? Uh, on the same area? Sure. Well, I'll begin in the confessional mode also, in that, that I, I also grew up with time and life, like a lot of people of our generation. And, and I also found them, I think, in a, in a subtle kind of way, inspirational to the writing of, of a kind of encompassing version of history, uh, and not, not merely a narrow uh, political or public policy oriented version. Um, the Time essay, which uh, appeared at some point in the 1960s, I believe, <clears throat> was also a model of a sort of, it, it turned out, uh, a, a somewhat superficial model, uh, but ultimately the kind of cultural criticism that I thought I wanted to combine with cultural history. So I think L Luce was promoting a, a lot of ideas that he may not have intentionally had uh, on his agenda. But with respect to the differences between journalism and history, I would have to agree with what I think was the underlying subtext of Mike's remarks, which are that it's, it's very difficult to locate that, that difference. It seems to me that the Washington Post used to call itself uh, the first draft of history. Uh, if you read the Washington Post, it was the first draft of history. Now, now it's the first draft of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Armed Services Committee uh, <laughs> uh, for, for, from, for the uh, brief for the Pentagon. But uh, in, once upon a time, they had that aspiration. So they, 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 were, they were seeking to blur that boundary uh, from the other direction. I tell my students uh, to get them out of their writer's blocks, think, you know, get in your Ben Hecht mode, you know, put on that smashed fedora, mm -hmm. sit down and you know, pretend you've got a, a deadline, an unmissable deadline tomorrow morning. There is something about journalism, and it is, of course, color and narrative and story uh, as, as well, that, that historians need to uh, inhale in, in deep drafts, I think, to, uh, uh, to enliven their work and to, and to make it accessible to a, uh, a wider than academic public. On the other hand, I think that there are things journalists, particularly broadcast journalists, uh, I won't exempt the writing press entirely, but I, uh, I would certainly say that this, this critique is primarily aimed at, at broadcast journalists, uh, <coughs> who I think can learn something from historians and, and indeed from their own tradition, their own muckraking traditions of of getting it right, of investigative journalism, of finding out uh, what actually happened to the extent they're able, and of defining objectivity not as balance, uh, but as honesty to the evidence. And it, it seems to me that this is something that historians have, uh, have tried to hang on to. Uh, and I think the notion of objectivity as impartiality or neutrality uh, or balance has, has become uh, a kind of scourge, particularly with respect to, uh, to broadcast journalism. I know. Uh, there's, a, there's a scandalous remark uh, available on the internet still from uh, Jim Lehrer, uh, who, uh, uh, when asked about this, what, what he considered his job uh, to be, uh, responded that well, it was simply to prevent, to, to present the different, the two different views uh, on an issue, of which it was assumed there were always merely two. Uh, so uh, here, here's one side that believes in global warming, and here's another that doesn't. You know, this this sort of thing. So I, I find this to be a, a, a troubling uh, tendency in, in, uh, in contemporary uh, journalism. I also think we have, uh, as historians, uh, longer memories, and that's going to be useful too, particularly with respect to uh, the recent history of the national security state, for example. Uh, the, uh, the United States has not uh, declared war on anyone since 1941, and yet we've fought many wars in that 
time. There are uh, most historians and most journalists alive today uh, have, have never seen or heard uh, a U.S. president ask Congress for a declaration of war, and yet that's an important part of our constitutional tradition that I think is uh, becoming uh, largely invisible in these times, and I think that uh, uh, there are, of course, journalists uh, who are trying to keep it uh, visible, and uh, we can talk about them, too, at some point. But I, uh, I think that uh, uh, Luce, you know, he, he uh, in, in a sense, uh, uh, generated a lot of uh, unintended consequences, certainly in the, the likes of, uh, of Michael and myself, anyway. But he, he uh, I think his capaciousness uh, was the great thing about him his his determination to to uh, to contain multitudes and I think that's uh, that's still a uh, an admirable aspiration for all of us. Rick, you've written about balance uh, mm -hmm. uh, as a either elusive or dangerous. Yeah. Can you can you talk a bit about that? I, I would like to. First of all, I'm awed and delighted that your students know who Ben Hecht is. <laughs> 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 I've heard all decades. Um, Loose yes. for him. Yes, <laughs> indeed. I, uh, I'm actually quite comfortable with, uh, I wrote it down, the definition of, uh, of journalism as the first draft of history. And, uh, but I want to propose sort of um, two models that have kind of emerged to honor that injunction. Uh, the first is um, a kind of um, self-arrogated task of civic-minded elites like Henry Luce, you know, in this city, uh, someone like Robert McCormick, I think uh, the news executives uh, in the golden age of TV journalism uh, and uh, um, anchormen and commentators of Alan's distinguished father, David Brinkley, was uh, first among equals, I think, among those who took it as their role uh, to address a national community um, as a national community and uh, make sense of it uh, in a way that um, uh, may or may not have actually had a point of view, but uh, it definitely had a set of moral valence to it. Uh, it was moralistic. And uh, they were um, setting boundaries of what was permissible and what was strange and what was normal. And uh, of course, that has come under a lot of criticism uh, over the years. And uh, what has replaced it is almost this pseudo-scientific uh, professionalized journalism uh, in which uh, there is this attempt to um, neutrally, objectively report uh, the world according to um, the ideology of balance. And I think it's an interesting and open question uh, which model has done a better job of uh, getting it right. Um, I, uh, as a case study, have, well, first of all, I've, I've been riveted by Time Magazine, uh, but I grew up with it, and that was kind of my window onto the world, but even more so as a historian. In my two books, I've kind of considered, in my, the back of my mind, and sometimes thought about writing about it explicitly, Time Magazine is a character, you know, as a dude, as a guy, <laughs> as a, and, and, and uh, because it had such a striking uh, a voice and uh, told a story. Um, I always told a story about the, the events of the day, a grand story, a meta-narrative. And um, you know, for my first book, uh, a big part of the story they told was about what to make of this uh, far-right movement that was emerging in the early 60s, people like the John Birch Society and Barry Goldwater. I want to maybe get more into that later. And then the second book, uh, Nixon Land, in which I'm writing about you know, the 65 to 72 period, it's what to make of these crazy hippies and anti-war activists and uh, took on a very fascinating voice, one that was quite sympathetic, actually. And um, kind of Time Magazine kind of took on its role in a cons cons confusing time of great cultural change as basically domesticating these strange things and explaining kind of how they came out of uh, sort of the uh, American vernacular. So for example, um, one example I found quite, uh, quite humorous and maybe didn't stand the test of time was the idea that Woodstock, Time Magazine, Life Magazine loved Woodstock. And uh, they considered it uh, an excellent development. Probably it was a lot better than people burning down campuses. But um, a, a line I'll always remember is they quoted someone quite approvingly saying, 
the use of LSD among these hippies is almost like a religious sacrament. So it, it kind of uh, it kind of um, bundled it with uh, America's uh, religious tradition. And uh, lo and behold, very soon, um, campaigners against uh, sex ed uh, in the late 60s and early 70s were waving around the special issue of Life magazine as an example of how America's liberal elites have uh, led us <coughs> astray. So there's a, there's, a, there's, there's a long history there. Um, but I just want to conclude um, by um, discussing this, uh, this crisis, I would say, uh, of balance. I recently um, was quoted, as many of us are, in a, a news article. Um, it was in an Iowa newspaper. Michelle Bachman had gone on talk radio in Iowa and had said something absolutely um, beyond the pale regarding um, the Democrats and Barack Obama. I wish I knew, remember precisely what it was. But it was part of an emerging, uh, what we've seen is an emerging uh, Republican discourse that sees Democrats and liberalism as basically illegitimate, as basically uh, not part of the American patrimony, as uh, not uh, reliable, trustworthy <coughs> governing partners or one side in a, a debate. And uh, in the article, um, said that they needed to balance, they also quoted something Jimmy Hoffa Jr. said, the head of the Teamsters. Uh, and he said something like, we're going to kill him in the next election. And these were seen as equivalent to violent rhetoric. And I wrote to the to the, um, to the reporter, uh, basically expressing my frustration that he wasn't getting it right, that reality was not being represented. And if if I may, I'm going to quote a few sentences he wrote back to me because I thought it was, I think it's a really outstanding, uh, it's a, really an outstanding uh, example of just how this normative shift uh, looks like in the uh, year like 2011 or 2012 now. He said, 50 years ago, the media was empowered to create a reality, reality which tracked the liberal consensus of the time, very much uh, one that Luce, I think, supported, even though he didn't like FDR, supporting the welfare state, government intervention slash investment in the economy, intellectualism, and so on. Some agreed, some didn't. Now conservatives, to a large extent, dictate the reality. And in their formulation, government is a monster. Rich people are martyrs, poor people are sinners, and the whole world is out to get anyone, quote, brave enough to say so. Some agree. Some don't. <laughs> My question is, what is the difference? In both instances, someone is successfully defining reality, which means that someone else is unsuccessfully defining it and is unhappy about it. To pick a side, he's speaking of himself, is a value judgment, not a recognition of what is true reality and what is a well-constructed hoax. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop when we can get into more about how um, uh, the media has been uh, defining uh, and reflecting back the far right to Americans, uh, I have some case studies in mind. But to, to leave it at that, just let's 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 think about how striking and how different uh, these two models of representing reality are. Um, I lots of threads have now come out that I suspect uh, others want to comment on. Uh, before doing that, I want to confess that in my house, uh, time and life were unwelcome. It was Look in Newsweek, and, <laughs> and, and that subscription was a kind of ideological statement. Um, Newsweek was more cosmopolitan, I guess, more liberal. More liberal. Yeah. Uh, Alan, I'd, more Jewish, <laughs> I'd like to ask you uh, uh, to react in part to what you've heard in terms of the way in which loose thought journalism should function. I mean, he didn't seem to have any... Uh, uh, difficulty in figuring out what side, if there were sides, to come down on. Well, I, th I think Luce, although he was not always a very popular figure among uh, journalists uh, in, the, in the mid 20th century, but he certainly did represent a period of journalism in which there was an effort to create some kind of consensus in the way uh, most journalists uh, thought about the world, including my own father. Uh, and uh, I, I think if, if we look back across the history of modern journalism, which I say would guess began in the uh, mid 19th century, uh, and continue in continuing our own time, you know, in the 19th century, journalism was uh, not consensual at all. Uh, newspapers were partisan; they were regional. 
Uh, they had uh, great difficulty gathering information uh, in the way that uh, in the 20th century became much easier. Uh, and uh, journalism in the 19th century was not a uh, consensual uh, uh, operation. It was, uh, it was what, in fact, we are moving towards today. In the 20th century, and especially the middle of the 20th century, uh, there was a belief that you could have a kind of, I mean, the, the New York Times, Time Magazine, many, many other, uh, Washington Post, many, many very good newspapers, uh, and they all had pretty similar views of how the world worked. Uh, I think what, what we're seeing today is the unraveling of a consensual journalism. Uh, newspapers are in trouble. Um, some of them have already died. Uh, others of them have gone entirely onto the internet. Uh, others are weekly instead of da dailies. Um, <coughs> and it's not just the um, it's not just the economy uh, that has made this uh, so difficult. Uh, for journalism to thrive, uh, although the economy is a big issue uh, for journalism. Uh, it's also uh, the way in which the United States and much of the world uh, has become a anti-consensual uh, culture. Um, and um, so I, I think, uh, you know, think, thinking about journalism uh, today, uh, it's hard to be very optimistic. Uh, there are lots of things that have, have emerged uh, in, on the internet and elsewhere that are really brilliant. Uh, but it's getting harder and harder, I think, for ordinary people to find a place uh, where they feel that they can <coughs> find the real truth about the world. Uh, now, maybe there is no such thing as a truth about the world, but uh, I think there's been a, uh, a fragmentation of the way journalism now works. Um, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but if, as we look ahead, I think we're going to see a very different kind of journalism. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it will look like, uh, but it's certainly not going to look like what it was 20, 30 years ago. Rick, you wanted to add a comment, yeah. but first let me just ask Jackson a question. Sure. You mentioned honesty to the evidence. Can you unpack that a bit? Well, I realize both of those key terms are, are problematic. Both honesty and evidence can be argued about in, uh, indefinitely. Uh, but as an ideal, it still seems to me more uh, productive and right than, uh, than some vain uh, goal of impartiality or neutrality. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking of, of really the, uh, the muckraking tradition, among others, uh, in journalism, uh, as, as well as historians' own commitment to research, uh, which is uh, you, you, you recognize that what you found is, is, uh, is partial, is incomplete, uh, that uh, you can even take the postmodern view, as I do, that, that everything is a text and is in open to interpretation, uh, including apparently uh, unproblematic data, uh, census data, etc. Uh, everything is open to interpretation. Nevertheless, you still uh, have this notion of, of uh, going to this text and, and being true uh, as you can to, uh, to what it says and getting it right, whether we're talking about, uh, if you'll excuse the expression, of returning to the title of this uh, event here. Uh, and, and so that, that's what seems to me not, not to have been lost by historians, but to have been, but to have been lost by journalists. Now, there, I, I, I agree that uh, during the era of, of uh, consensus, the mid-century managerial consensus <coughs> that uh, both Rick and, and, and Alan have, have uh, described quite well, uh, there, there were boundaries, uh, of course, to you know, what was admitted into legitimate discourse, uh, just as there, uh, I, I would argue there still are today, in spite of the fragmentation that I agree has occurred and I think that I'm not look. I'm certainly not looking back to the mid 20th century as, as a, uh, a golden age when when uh, journalists really were committed to getting it right. Uh, some were, and some weren't. Uh, Luce was committed to getting it right according to his lights, uh, according to his ideological commitments, which were often led him 
strikingly astray with respect to the communist Chinese versus the nationalist Chinese, for example, and other, uh, other events. So uh, it, it is, uh, and I'm sure he believed he was being honest to the evidence. Uh, so uh, I'm not suggesting that that's a, uh, that phrase is a, is a kind of magic bullet. Uh, but I, I throw it out as an alternative to what seems to me uh, the, the, the much more dangerous, uh, shallower, and, and uh, destructive notion <coughs> of, uh, of balance and, and neutrality, um, which is which is truly unattainable and not desirable either, for that matter. Yeah. Mark, can I make a quick comment on that? Is that okay, Rick? Um, <laughs> Go for it. Go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to say, I, I, I dissent a bit. Well, no, I dissent strongly from the idea that uh, uh, we no longer create consensual narratives and that we are living in an age of fragmentation. I mean, it would be foolish not to admit that that's the way the media looks now, especially since the days of three networks and three great, great newspapers. But, I mean, think about something like uh, the consensus that was shared in the Republican and the Democratic Party that uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and that uh, the smoking gun might be a, a, a mushroom cloud. Think of the consensus that uh, our economic problems are the result of uh, deficits and debts and that the answer is uh, public austerity, uh, a transnational, uh, trans-ideological consensus certainly shared by Barack Obama, the Cuban socialist, uh, and, uh, and, and Boehner and all the rest. Now, what's different is who constructs these consensual narratives, and I, I'd point to the um, very important work by the media critics uh, John Nichols and Robert McChesney, who have done some fascinating empirical research uh, using census data, figuring out the ratio of journalists to public relations professionals. Um, as uh, the world of journalism collapses economically, it's becoming even worse. There's a really funny uh, boxing movie from the 50s in which a sports writer becomes a publicist, right? Well, that's the, the career path of choice now. Uh, people have become very sophisticated among our elites in uh, creating stories about reality that are unquestioned. And um, in the case of weapons of mass destruction, it was a literal conspiracy, you know, uh, by um, people acting in concert with uh, media professionals like uh, Judith Miller. In the case of austerity, you have uh, you know a billionaire like Pete Peterson setting up foundations and. Uh, having people write op-eds and all the rest. So what we see as a result of the decline of this sort of civic-minded uh, journalism that I think, uh, with profound exceptions, Henry Luce uh, represented, I think, nobly, um, is um, something in which uh, the interests have taken over for the from the public interest. Michael? Yeah, I guess I'd like to just say a few words of uh, dissent, <laughs> again, um, I'm not advertising my magazine. Do you want to hold it up? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, hold it up. <laughs> no, that's not the, the, that, that's not the uh, meaning I'm, I'm giving to you. Uh, from the idea, uh, you know, a little bit disagreement, I guess, with, with Alan, also with Rick, um, about the idea there was ever anything like a golden age of journalism. Um, they didn't put it that way, but there were a time when, when there was really a, a, a opportunity for a much more balanced uh, Reporting, um, um, and, and uh, <coughs> Jackson mentioned the, uh, the muckrakers too. I mean, I think, uh, to my mind, the golden age. If there's golden age journalism, it was it was when the, the the press was as popular as it ever was, probably, which is roughly from the 1880s to the 1920s. I think, in the sense that, um, I think, uh, uh, readership uh, went up by a factor of 10 times or 15 times, but far over what the uh, Daily population was, and there were um, a lot of ethnic papers. There were eight or nine dailies in New York City, and three or four in almost every uh, major and many minor cities as well. And, but what was uh, important about that period, I think, uh, is that uh, there was, as Alan said, there was no objectivity. Uh, there was great popularity, um, and there was tremendous diversity uh, of opinion in all these papers. And you know, in novels of the period, you often find people sitting down to read the papers, uh, not just their paper, but they realize that. You know, if they were going to read uh, the paper called the Republican or the other one called the Democrat, <laughs> and perhaps one called the Socialist, uh, that they were going to get different points of view on the same issues, on the same stories, and that was um, what it meant in part to be a, an educated uh, citizen, a, a real participant in the civic uh, life of the country. Um, 
with my mind, that was, you know, now I'm not saying we were true to that now, necessarily. <laughs> Obviously, um, people who look at Huffington Post just to see, you know, the pinups are not, <laughs> are not getting uh, some of the richness that is there in, in the Huffington Post and other places. But, but I, I do think that in some ways, uh, the media world now is, is, is quite lively. We have, you know, yes, we have consensus, but then we also have Paul Krugman, you know, uh, on the Times, uh, disagreeing with a lot of his consensus and, and helping to mobilize people to a certain degree against it. Um, we have some very good investigative reporting uh, in places like the New Yorker. Um, so um, and I think it's, it's important to realize that, uh, you know, we are, you know, uh, still in the postmodernist moment and will be for most of our lifetimes. And, and we should make the best of it in that sense, I think. And, and historians, uh, I mean, I, I wrote the biography of William James Bryan, who actually, on his passport, uh, asked to, to list a occupation, say a journalist, because um, he spent all his life writing journalism. And in some ways, I think uh, no one would think of Bryan as a objective uh, reporter uh, of anything. Um, and more power to him in that sense. Uh, I think we should encourage a multiplicity of intelligent uh, journalism rather than bewailing uh, its fragmentation. Uh, Alan, uh, Michael mentioned you as someone he was dissenting from. Is there any daylight between your conceptions? Well, I, th I think I do agree with Rick that there certainly are consensual views on many issues at, at various points in, uh, in our age, and uh, the Iraq War is a very good example of it. Uh, and people do. Uh, race uh, to what seem to be the obvious points. Uh, I, I think, though, that if you, t if you think about the, not so much about the way in which uh, Americans uh, understand uh, their world at the time, uh, I, I've, been think I've, I've been thinking more about what the uh, journalist, uh, what journalism is becoming. Um, so think about the New York Times, which has been the greatest newspaper in the United States for many decades, and still is, I think. Uh, but it's sure not the same as it was 20, 30 years ago. And it's not just um, because t the time has changed, it's because they just don't have the money anymore. Uh, they have about half the number of reporters that they had. Uh, there's much more opinion uh, and much less reporting. Uh, and that's the New York Times. It's, yeah. it's much worse than much other uh, newspapers. So I, uh, putting aside the consensus issue, uh, I think the future of journalism is going to become more and more fragmented. That may not be a bad thing, uh, but uh, I, I, think, I, I think not. Um, I think it, it, having, a, uh, having, a, having a newspaper or newspapers uh, that have authority uh, are something that we should uh, hope will, will survive, e even though there are many other forms of journalism that are important and powerful as well. But uh, I think, uh, I, I worry that the great newspapers are disappearing uh, or becoming much less important. And uh, somehow I think there, there is a space for uh, great journalism, journalistic uh, institutions that uh, help <coughs> people understand a, a broad view of the world. It's, uh, Rick, it's a testimony, I think, to Alan's uh, capacity to uh, encompass all of Henry Luce that you might describe Henry Luce in any way as noble. Yeah, uh, it is interesting, because he was seen as this enamored liberal, and uh, think the Democratic Party is uh, not liberal enough, and Luce was, of course, uh, seen as a Republican partisan, and uh, certainly saw himself as a Republican partisan. Uh, but um, I mean, I recognize in his pages, and in, in these pages, uh, someone who agreed with the, the broad uh, governing consensus of the time that government uh, can have an affirmative, uh, has an affirmative role in making American life better, and he was quite vociferous in pushing back against uh, the right wing of the Republican Party. I'm, I'm interested in the, the business stuff. Before you get yeah. there, Jackson, did you have a comment on something that was already well, on Alan, the table? Well, Alan just introduced a key word to me, which is authority, mm -hmm. uh, and the absence of it uh, in, yeah. in the contemporary. I believe, too, it was it, what, what Rick <coughs> and everyone else has been saying about the persistence of, of consensus in these, uh, in, in, the, in a kind of, there's a kind of maddeningly 
baffling sense that I have when you know I go from one, one set of media to another. Uh, I go from one set of media, which would be the uh, on the left, like to call the mainstream media or the corporate media, to the internet, and I find there uh, all kinds of views that. Uh, that are powerfully, I think, uh, argued and, and well buttressed with evidence uh, against austerity or against uh, knee-jerk interventionism abroad. But these kinds of, of uh, uh, ideas don't make it into public discourse. Uh, and the consequence is there's, a, there's I think, a, a deep alienation in the population. I'm not saying anything startling or new here, but I think there's a, there are these consensuses yeah. still exists with respect to foreign policy or with respect to fiscal policy. Uh, but they don't have the kind of public support uh, yeah. that they did 50 years ago. Uh, I think there's a, in, instead a deep cynicism about how these, the, uh, these allegedly uh, authoritative views are, are manufactured uh, and that there are other equally authoritative views out there that are just not getting that kind of influence. Yeah. Uh, Krugman <coughs> is sort of the exception that proves the rule. It seems well, another example would be you know, Occupy Wall Street, the OWS. Yes. yes. The which, crisis of legitimacy. <coughs> right. And <coughs> you know, this could become a very important uh, period of, of our lives. So on the other hand, you know, where are the organizations, where are the institutions that might uh, allow them to build and, and become uh, very influential? I'm not sure how that will, that will happen. I mean, you think of the civil rights movement, and it really had um, <coughs> traction over a long period of time. OWS, I'm not sure yet. Uh, but it certainly raises issues that uh, you know, should be raised, and um, it's very hard now. I think uh, for people to uh, create uh, a, a space for for dissent. Um, yeah. so <laughs> I, I, well, of course, also at the same time, OWS <coughs> was informed by a lot of media that was obviously not mainstream media. Um, over the years, a lot of people making kind of arguments that surfaced uh, in Ducati Park in mid-September um, had been talk about underground the nation and uh, <coughs> all kinds of you know hundreds of websites um, both here and in other countries um, and that in some ways shows that people can, will inform themselves if they're unhappy they will find ways to inform themselves uh, from journalism uh, or otherwise at the same time I think you know loose um, wanted you know mm -hmm. America was united <coughs> by something now America is united by a technology <laughs> perhaps not much more and and part of the problem with the people uh, in OWS, I think, is that they, in some ways, are a little too besotted by that technology. And so they think, we have the technology, we have the meetups, we have ways to communicate online. We don't really need institutions beyond that. And that, I think, is... We don't uh, need uh, our stars being reflected back to America by free networks. Right, right. <laughs> which well, they, 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 they had that for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's my cue to <coughs> quote something that uh, Jackson wrote in a review of Paul Starr's creation of the media. Um, he, uh, it is delusional to pretend that the lumbering behemoths of the contemporary media industry have preserved any of the old Republican concerns for an educated citizenry. <laughs> That's what I want to talk about. <laughs> I still believe it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that is, that is a, a concern here, of course, and that's lowercase Republican. Yes. Uh, that uh, This is what, uh, of course, I, I tend to believe is cent central to democracy. It's not about voting, per se. It's about an informed citizenry like the one that Michael was describing in the early 20th century. Again, not to sentimentalize that moment. There were plenty of limitations on it, but uh, yeah. that, that sense that, uh, that people were engaged with a variety of points of view that they recognized were, were coming from different ideological directions and that they uh, were attempting to sort out among themselves and in conversation with one another. So it is, it is a question not, uh, not merely of, of uh, uh, creating uh, consensus, but of cre creating uh, ripples of dissent within that consensus that can enlarge it or, or, or challenge it or, yeah. or even deliberately fragment it. And I, I, I think, I'm sorry, just oh, one other sorry. point about the civil rights movement, I think it's much easier for the civil rights movement to be assimilated into uh, mainstream American 
political culture, it seems to me, because these, uh, this, this was a demand sim for, for a, ver a very simple kind of straightforward justice. This is our country, too. You know, we want what everyone else has. You know, it was powerful. It was unanswerable. And no one has been able to, to uh, dismiss it ever since. It's a moment that we keep re re returning to, I think, journalistically. You mentioned Taylor Branch and others. But, you know, it, because it's a, it's, a, it's a heroic moment in our, in our history when uh, the civil rights movement uh, succeeded. But the anti-war movement, of course, has, has never, uh, uh, the anti-Vietnam War movement, for example, or Occupy Wall Street, other movements that, that challenge more entrenched institutions <coughs> and, and that indeed in ch uh, challenge the consensus uh, have not fared so well. Uh, so I, I think that uh, uh, once again we're you know we're in this we're in the situation of uh, where everyone talks of diversity but everything seems the same. There's a certain paradox. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I want to think about all these broader issues in the his in the context of uh, the business of media. And the history of the business of media. And the <coughs> broader question, I think, is one of authority. Do media now speak with authority? Can they speak with authority? Do they used to speak with authority? Of course, now we're talking about you know, newspapers, even the New York Times, that have you know, less reporting, more opinion, I would say, more gossip. Maybe you know, uh, the Washington Post isn't the first draft of history. It's the first draft of People magazine. You know. <laughs> um, so that what happened? Mentioned. You know, there's a story yeah. about they this. They hope. They hope. Yeah. <laughs> there, you know, Nothing like a good soundbite. News newspapers are going out of business. Journalists <coughs> are losing their uh, losing their jobs. They're becoming public relations agents. What happened? Why did this happen? There's a narrative about why this happened that involves technology. You know, people started reading blogs. The internet destroyed newspapers. I think that's a, a, a very self-serving narrative on the part of media barons because this happened before there was an internet. And what happened was that um, newspapers, generally family-owned newspapers, um, were uh, bought by media conglomerates or uh, companies that didn't uh, specialize in media at all and uh, were publicly traded. And suddenly these newspapers had to show you know, double-digit profits every quarter. And uh, how, that, uh, how that played itself out was newspapers started dumbing themselves down, and they started eating their seed corn. I mean, they started uh, uh, abrogating the very qualities that made them valuable to their uh, constituencies, which was giving you something meaty to, to read, to, to hold on to. I mean, the Sun-Times, not to insult them, uh, it's, it's a typical Go in all newspapers. I mean, it's, it's barely a newspaper. It's a little, <coughs> you know, it's a little scrap of a thing. And um, uh, what's striking, to bring it back to loose, is that he provided a different model, a, a different business model. That's what you get across in the book and you mentioned here, which was that he, in, in your presentation, that he had a confidence that quality would out. That if he used the best paper, the best journalism, didn't cut corners, and didn't uh, write down to his readers, um, and especially in the case of someone like Fortune, which was just, um, you know, collector's items because they're so beautiful and they're so rich and they're so wonderful that he could make lots of money and he did and he became the richest you know one of the richest men in America uh, the model of how you make money now is very different in media it's um, how can we cut corners it's the same austerity that's kind of uh, resonating across our culture it's the bean counter mentality it's the idea that journalism isn't any different from any other business so let's um, run a spreadsheet and look at our uh, costs and let's uh, get rid of these bureaus that are just drains on our uh, resources. And lo and behold, what do we have? No one reads newspapers anymore. Is it coincidence? I think not. Is the idea that the press serves a public interest <coughs> first and then profits follow from that, is that, is that uh, romanticized and dead? Yeah. I mean, uh, I think that um, it, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it died because of a shift in the norms of capitalism. I mean, it's the same reason steel mills died in the Midwest. You know, they made 5% quarterly profit instead of 15% quarterly profit. So let's liquidate them and, 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 and figure out ways to divest uh, the workers of their pensions and manufacture our steel in Japan and financialize the economy, right? There's only one way of thinking how profit works. It's not enough to have a steady return and also have uh, a set of multiple stakeholders, the community you're answerable to, say in the case of the steel mill, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, the South Shore of Chicago, uh, in the case of a newspaper, uh, the civic uh, public that you're addressing, uh, there's only one model of value. And this is a broad uh, shift. And in a sense, it's a shift away from uh, loose-ism uh, in its uh, broadest sense. I have to repeat myself, but are we afraid, are we in danger here of, of playing, uh, being nostalgics a little bit? I mean, after all, you know, capitalism is a, you know, creative slash destructive system, and, and uh, inevitably, when this new technology came online, you know, young people especially were going to adopt it, and, and um, businesses would have to adapt to it. I mean, you know, I, I hear all the time of, of rich individuals, uh, not unlike uh, Luce when he was richer, um, just spending $5 million on a new website and hiring 10 people on their website. Now we can say the quality of the journalism on the website is not as good as it would have been uh, 50 years ago if uh, those same five people had started a newspaper um, in some mid-sized Midwestern city, but that's not gonna happen, obviously. So, um, you know, one, one thing I'd just like to raise maybe to not to get away from perhaps the agenda you've got, Marty, but is, is the question of the visual you know, both in journalism and history. I mean, the thing to me that when I was a kid reading life, especially in time, especially Times cover, <coughs> especially too, was how much you learned from the visual of, of those. And uh, I think um, I um, well, ran across, uh, when I was used to be a labor historian, um, an incredible uh, series of articles about a steel worker in Alcippa, Pennsylvania, named uh, Lopata, I forget his first name, um, who, um, uh, you know, was earning $3.50 an hour, um, and when the steel union came, he made $5 an hour, um, and um, Alfred Eisenstadt was, was hired to uh, illustrate uh, this guy's uh, life, and there are photos of um, uh, Lopata uh, at the door, his wife, who was barefoot, uh, giving him his, his box lunch, and <coughs> walking three miles to work, uh, and then being totally exhausted at the end of the day and lying sort of half contentedly on the on the lawn outside his little his little shack, um, and then being washed off by his uh, by his wife from the outdoor pump because they had the window plumbing. And then ten years later, Eisenstadt goes back there and finds he's got a brick house. He has eight kids now. He had three kids before. Um, life isn't isn't wonderful, but you know he can make ten eleven dollars a day by 1946. Uh, he's worried about inflation, but he's got a secure job. I mean, this to me illustrated what the union could do for people much better than uh, four or five wonderful texts in some ways about that. And for me, that's, I think uh, my students, as we all know, people uh, um, sitting here and out there in the audience as well, um, you know, they often learn more from a good PowerPoint slide, which I then talk about, <laughs> than they do uh, from a wonderful journal article. So I wonder whether in some ways that is a, uh, Sort of intersection between what's happened with journalism and to a certain degree what's happened with at least history teaching. I'd like to pursue that, but I, I think Alan had a comment you wanted to make. Were you gesturing? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, but before we uh, continue along that realm, which I think also brings us to popular culture uh, and the visual storytelling, uh, it, it raises the question of who are the educators of the educated citizenry, whether intentional or uh, de facto. And uh, politicians, uh, in some ways, are among them. Uh, and Michael, I just wanted to uh, quote the title of a piece you wrote in the New Republic. Uh, it was called, Newt Gingrich, American's Worst Historian. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, do you think there is a sense in which American citizens, some American citizens, get their history from political figures like Newt Gingrich? Uh, definitely. I mean, I think the best-selling historian in America, at least was, Glenn Beck last year. I'm not sure how his sales are doing this year. And uh, I mean, if you ever watch Glenn Beck's program, uh, which maybe people watch C-SPAN haven't done much, but uh, uh, many people in America have, at least when he was on Fox. Uh, I mean, he was. He was using a, a whiteboard, and he was giving history lessons, history lectures, um, in a very dramatic way, uh, often with tears in his eyes. You know. um, and of course, for him, the progressive era was the beginning of uh, the, the descent into uh, into hell uh, for America. Um, um, and so, yeah, we have. But of course, we've always had 
people like that. I mean, back in the 1890s, there was a, um, a Coins Financial School, you know, which was this key work for, uh, for populists. Um, and it was a work of this, uh, and um, work popular economics of this piece. So that's not new, but uh, in many ways, I think conservatives now probably have a more, uh, how should I say, a coherent narrative <coughs> of history than people on the left do. In part because people like Glenn And um, I mean, a lot of our politicians, I won't specify, party are really poor historians. <laughs> And our journalists are very poor uh, fact checkers of that history. I actually uh, recently wrote a blog post um, for a blog. We're talking about the, uh, whether the media is ideological and divided or not. The, the, the blog I write for sometimes is called BrooksandLiars.com. So it's, it's, uh, no, no, no objectivity there. <laughs> and uh, I wrote about uh, Rick Santorum's uh, victory speech in Iowa, which was hailed um, by, among others, the excellent uh, Washington Post columnist E.J. Dion is a, a modeled speech, as the best speech of the night. And I pointed out that uh, in arguing that uh, so the American dream is uh, alive uh, and can be restored, and that America is a place of freedom and opportunity, he uh, told the story, a typical one, of his immigrant grandfather coming to America for freedom and opportunity. And uh, the implication being, because he did that, uh, he, uh, he, Rick Santorum, his family is enjoyed, able to enjoy freedom now. In between these two po polls, he, he, he mentioned that his dad, uh, his grandpa, was a coal miner in Pennsylvania, and that he was paid in what he called coupons, and what historians know as scrip. Mm -hmm. Which means that his, his uh, grandpa lived in a company town, he was probably kept in something close to debt slavery, and uh, he had no freedom to move because he wasn't paid in cash. He described his grandpa coming from Mussolini's Italy to something in America that resembled feudalism. And then he just went all along and, and said, uh, well, you know, um, uh, Barack Obama and the Democrats want to destroy the freedom of this great American system <laughs> that created this wealth and uh, prosperity for my family. I was the only person who noticed this. <laughs> um, so you know, I don't want to you know toot my own horn, but um, a historical claim was made. It was a solecism of, of the first order that exposed uh, a profound fallacy at the heart of uh, what Rick Santorum was saying about freedom and liberty. Now, ideally, a democratic politician would point this out and say the Democrats have a vision of freedom and liberty too, and it involves the fact that when you have things like debt slavery and uh, uh, um, things like um, uh, the inability to move without getting jailed because you owe your soul to the some company store, Democrat, uh, that, that the government can step in and actually establish liberty. Uh, and that uh, un, 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 untethered property often violates liberty. Um, no Democrat did it, no journalist did it. So we have a crisis of historical representation. Jack. Uh, I think that's an excellent example. I'm, I, I'm, I want to rise to a slightly more aerial view here of, of, on the question of journalists versus historians and, uh, and, and the accounts they give of, uh, of the past and the present for that matter. Because it seems to me there is a conceptual issue here that, it, that is very troubling to me and I think it affects, uh, <coughs> it, it affects self-described conservatives and self-described centrists uh, it, uh, as, as well as people farther to the left, liberals as well, I guess. Uh, and that is the, the, the addiction to technological determinism. Uh, and Rick alluded to this earlier um, in, in connection with the, the invocation of, uh, of the internet uh, as the explanation for the decline of newspapers or the explanation for the decline of the post office when in fact we're talking about shareholders and legislators making decisions. Of course, I agree there is a consumer demand out there, Mike, for Visual for the internet for all the things that we, we know uh, the young are, are craving, uh, and from our classes, if nothing else. Nevertheless, there is there is a tendency, I think, and and this is particularly true of, of journalists. Uh, Tom Friedman is, in my mind, the main offender here, but he's maybe just the most conspicuous, which is which is to in, in, invoke uh, technology as a uh, as an explanation. Uh, for inevitable change to which we have to adjust 
uh, whether we want to or not. But this goes along with the celebration of freedom and choice that you're that Santorum and, and others are always uh, referring to as well. So we have to love to do, we have to want to do uh, what we're going to have to do anyway, which is <laughs> embrace uh, this future. And self-described conservatives uh, like Jeb Bush, for example, and others are uh, in the vanguard of uh, you know, promoting uh, online education uh, in ways that will, uh, in, in my view, my dinosaur-like view, uh, undermine what is, after all, at the heart of the educational relationship, which is the, which is the face-to-face connection between teachers and students. Uh, it, it seems to me uh, that people who call themselves conservatives, in fact, are, are, uh, uh, are quite willing. And Gingrich is another good example. He likes to present himself as being on, on the cutting edge of, of technological change, and everything that he uh, is proposing is, of course, dictated by the inevitability of uh, a certain kind of cyber future that he uh, is, is shaping in his, in his own uh, fantastic and disturbing way. But this, this seems to me something else that historians have, a, have, have an opportunity uh, to challenge. His, historians, in, in precisely the ways that, that you guys have both done, actually, in, with respect to these both, these, these narratives of, of, uh, uh, of laboring men and of previous generations, uh, we do tell stories and, and we love complexity. Complexity is the historian's trope, right? <laughs> Uh, every time a historian comes to a conference of social scientists, he gets to be the one who says, uh, uh, well, I like these models very much, but... <laughs> and are journalists addicted to simplicity? Is that the implication? They shouldn't be, ideally. I would, I would argue that uh, the tradition of investigative journalism would be keep, keep digging, and again, getting, getting it right means getting it in all its complexity. Uh, of course, you can get tangled up in, in uh, self, you know, contradictory assertions and the like. But you, you've got to come up with a, uh, a, 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 a clear conclusion at some point. But it, it does seem to me uh, that by by complexity, we're often talking about uh, human agency. We're talking about unintended consequences as well of human action. Uh, we're talking about you know purposes mistook, falling on the inventor's head, and the like. These are the kinds of things that. Uh, historians have engaged with, I think, which is why I tell my students history is essentially tragic. It's not <laughs> because it's sad, although it often is, but that it's about the history of unintended consequences and, uh, and, and precisely those uh, that, that don't fall into uh, <coughs> neat deterministic formulas. Alan, as you were working on the book, did the notion, how did the notion of getting it right uh, play out, if at all? Was, is it something which is uh, clear to you, controversial, irrelevant? Uh, well, I mean, of course, I, I tried to get my own work right, <laughs> but did, did Luce really try to get it right? I think he did try, uh, but he was, you know, he lived within a world in which uh, a whole range of areas of, of American life were completely out of sight. And Luce didn't make much of an effort to find them. Uh, for example, he, at one point he did a, um, or I'd say he, uh, Life Magazine did a piece on uh, Middletown in Transition, the, the second volume of, of this, of the Lynn's uh, Middletown. Uh, and they had a, a series of photographs of how people in Muncie, which is what the town that Middletown represented, Muncie, Indiana, uh, they have pictures of all the different levels of, of people in uh, in Muncie, Indiana, and they had the balls at the top. The ball uh, ball, ball family. family was the the, you know, the big uh, wealthy people, and uh, and they got all the way down to people who lived with chickens in their in their kitchen. Uh, all the photographs were the same. Mm -hmm. uh, the surroundings uh, weren't the same, but there was the same sort of happy uh, family sort of vision uh, from the wealthiest people to the poorest people. They, they all, every, everybody was the same. Uh, so no, he didn't get it right. Uh, and it's, he didn't get it right because he didn't really want it to be what it was supposed to be. Um, 
And I think uh, in our time, uh, we don't always get it right either, but at least <coughs> we, I think we do see the differences that, uh, that Luce didn't, what didn't see. Uh, and there were so many areas of life, um, sexuality, uh, feminism, uh, for a long time, race, it was just out of sight most of the time. Uh, and I think, you know, it's a much more difficult world uh, when all of these things say, sort of merged came up into the culture, uh, but it, it's all, I think we're better off in that way. Um, the idea of a large consensual uh, journalism is, uh, which is what I grew up with, um, and, and what I, um, of course, uh, believed in uh, since I was in a journalism family. Uh, Think of, and the idea was that you know, the, the larger the audience, the, the more important uh, the, the, uh, um, the, the television news was. Well, the most important uh, news, uh, television news in the world is CCTV in China, <laughs> uh, w which a billion people watch uh, every day. Uh, I don't think we would. Uh, like to live in a world in which uh, CCTV is the model uh, for what we have. So I think we're, we're better off than we may think we are. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, at the same time, the, w the, the nightly news has withered to a level. Uh, in the, if you put together the, uh, the audience for the three major nightly news shows, uh, NBC, CBC, CBS and ABC, you put the audience for those three together are less than any uh, of the three nightly news were, any one of the nightly news were, had more audience than the three all together now. Um, and there's, there's nothing in those uh, nightly news shows anymore. Um, so the, the, the challenge, I think, of getting it right is to find uh, ways in which to make sure that people <coughs> have access. It's not going to be as easy access as it used to be when everybody thought the New York Times had all the news that was uh, fit to print. Uh, I think uh, the danger is that news will disappear because there won't be any money for anybody to uh, create it. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think what we'll have is a very fragmented but much more thorough uh, way of learning about what the world is, is becoming. In a moment, I'm going to invite questions, <coughs> excuse me, from the room, but I have three quick questions, one for each of you. Um, Rick, you and, <coughs> excuse me, you and Michael were signers of a letter about an ABC miniseries called The Path to 9-11. Right. In which you said that the, uh, uh, you complained of the falsification of history by a responsible broadcast network, yes. ABC. How important do you think that is to have popular culture get it right? Well, that's an interesting question. I am uh, personally uh, not a, a stickler for um, sort of uh, a pedantic sort of historical accuracy in uh, popular culture and its representations of history. I, I say if it's good enough for Shakespeare, it's good enough for me, <laughs> you know. But I do think that um, there's a different conception of truth that has to be honored in any representation of history, and that's a certain kind of poetic or moral truth. And, um, you know, what offended me, you know, in that particular miniseries was uh, just, you know, uh, just made stuff up about uh, the culpability of the Clinton administration in 9-11, uh, and that it was also, um, you know, I, I'm not recalling the details, but I think there were some partisans involved that had an agenda. Um, but um, in popular culture, um, and I, you know, uh, I think that you can um, get at a broader truth about history in a well-crafted uh, uh, story um, that um, you can kind of excuse uh, some of the, the facts that uh, uh, maybe were truncated and poet poetic license. I mean, just kind of quickly, um, 
you know, I thought that um, um, Oliver Stone did a pretty good job with Nixon. You know, I think that had a poetic truth about Nixon that, that I think has t stands up. I think that JFK was a travesty. Uh, I think, but if you weight each on a scale, at Oliver Stone's JFK, they probably had an equal number of quote unquote mistakes or distortions. Michael, uh, you, I read, quoted uh, as saying that Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States represents a simplistic, propagandistic understanding of American history, which startled me. Uh, not that I disagree, I just start, was startled to see it. Um, yeah, I've taken some flack for that from, from my left, uh, <laughs> um, uh, quite a lot, actually. Um, but, uh, well, that's, we, that would begin a whole other discussion about, about a different kind of history. I mean, Zinn's not really a journalist, was, was not really a journalist, but... But, but also yeah. not a historian in your mind? Well, no, I think he was certainly a historian, um, but I think he was a historian who was trying who, who was teaching a, a version of history which, to my mind, is uh, yeah, simplistic, but also um, uh, <coughs> romantic, you know, in, in a, a way which uh, I think uh, is, uh, verges on, on almost falsehood, because uh, for, for Zinn, um, the people, he also used the term 99%, actually, before that became popular, 99% uh, are always virtuous and right, there's no the difference between them were relatively unimportant, but somehow they always keep losing to the one percent. Um, and he has, to my mind, are 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 um, outmoded and, and erroneous um, interpretations of key events in American history, like the Civil War, which he sees in Beardian terms, very simplistic Beardian terms, as the the Northern industrial interests um, vanquishing uh, the South. Of course, he also somehow puts abolitionists in there somewhere, but you end up thinking the abolitionists were kind of hoodwinked by the industrialists, you know. Um, and uh, that doesn't explain why, say, Frederick Douglass was a Republican at the end of his life, for example, uh, this industrialist party. Um, so, but again, I mean, just like a lot of popular journalistic uh, versions of history, I mean, that book sold two million copies, far more than anybody on this panel will ever sell. Uh, <laughs> in fact, probably more than anybody out there combined will ever sell <laughs> of their books. And I think, you know, it's had uh, a good impact on sort of young people on the left, uh, encouraging them to, them to be activists because it gives them a narrative. And um, you know, I'm, I, all the time that there were uh, a lot of people uh, in our profession uh, who were dumping on the master narrative, uh, I, I was never one of those people. Not that we should have one narrative that everyone subscribes to, but but unless we have a coherent narrative, uh, if it's all complexity and. Uh, um, uh, if it's all exceptions to this and exceptions to that, uh, then 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 people will be bored by it, and and only scholars will will want to read about it. And uh, I was so happy when when uh, you know Jackson wrote his wonderful book, uh, Rebirth of a Nation, because um, this is I think the best narrative of this period. <coughs> but it's a narrative which is unlike Zinn, uh, alive to contradiction, alive to irony, alive to to tragedy of a of a sort of classic kind, and. Um, but obviously, uh, his book will not be assigned in uh, many high schools, unlike Zoom. Jackson, in uh, the same piece of yours that I quoted earlier, you also say, the public sphere is a mess. <laughs> and I'm, I'm <laughs> wondering, <laughs> uh, to the degree that you still believe that, I'm wondering whether you think that either journalism or uh, history, the profession of uh, journalism and the profession of uh, historians, can contribute to changing that. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, that's what that's what gets me out of bed every morning. I think that that this naive but persistent idea that uh, that if we do get it right, and by we I mean <coughs> journalists and historians alike, then uh, uh, then we can uh, somehow uh, uh, contribute to a, a, a more uh, vital. Public sphere, one one where uh, points of view are actively and intelligently debated, and not merely dismissed or excluded because they don't fall into the current conventional wisdom. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the context of that sentence was, but uh, I'm I'm sure that that uh, that it, that it uh, it had to do in part with this uh, uh, continued dominance of let's face it, you know, gi giant corporations in the 
manufacture of news, which is then often muddled with uh, entertainment or misinformation. Uh, and the challenge to that, which I think uh, all of us have alluded to in one way or another with varying degrees of, uh, of, of sympathy, uh, and, I, and I think all of us with, with, with real sympathy, the, the internet, for whatever, for lack of a better term, is, is a kind of alternative public sphere. Uh, and in fact, it is the public sphere for, for many people now. Uh, and, and it's a mess too. But then there are a lot of other interesting things going on. I mean, I often think about this last 50 years of our history as, as being, uh, as, as Alan's book so brilliantly demonstrated, this uh, a shift from coherence to fragmentation uh, beginning in the 1960s. And yet, uh, one could also see it as a shift from to reverse Walter Lippmann's famous duality from, from mastery to drift. <laughs> uh, and, and drift is not always a bad thing, as we know. Drift can, you, you can drift into interesting places and, and, uh, uh, and reconfigure uh, public discourse accordingly. So that would be my hope. Um, I'm going to invite questions. There is a microphone which will come to you. Uh, though it won't amplify your voice, so please don't use that as a, as a reason not to speak loudly, and also please identify yourself. Steve. So, Microphone. Mic there, no, it's, 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 oh, it's there. You're good. <laughs> uh, God. Steve Ross. Um, I have a comment, and you can respond if you want. It, it, getting back to Marty's original question about differences between, fundamental differences journalists and historians, I'd say you could use TSP, timing, style, perspective, profits. Timing, I was a uh, graduate student at Oxford in the 70s. Modern history was 400 AD to 1918. And when I asked my tutor, why did you stop in 1918? He said, totally straight faced. Everything after 1918 is journalism. <laughs> So one thing, one perspective is many of, all of you have written, you're doing op-ed pieces, but it's contemporaneous history. It's contempor contemporaneous events that mark the journalist. We venture into it sometimes, but we don't really, we only do that if we are doing our own op-ed pieces. Otherwise, we are looking at a more distant past. Second, style. Journalists are being read more because they write better. Than we do. They are writing for a larger audience. They are writing in a more simplistic, and I don't mean that in a negative way, straightforward, simplistic manner, where we're never taught to write. We pick it up on our own, and either we write to each other, or maybe we write to a broader audience, but we don't write to a general public. And the final one is perspective and profit. We are, we do bring to the table a kind of perspective that journalists don't do. And in fact, I would suggest, as uh, one of my friends who's a, one of the, probably the highest ranking woman in network news, um, has said journal when she gets invited to journalism school to talk, she's never invited a second time because she tells them that nobody should ever be an undergraduate major in journalism because you learn no perspective, that you should be a history major, or if not that, at the very least, politics or international relations, so that when you write a story, you have a sense of context. You have a sense of where this fits, both at the moment and in the larger <coughs> history. And finally, journalists are still working for companies that are concerned with profits. We are not concerned with profits, either as professors or in our own books. I mean, yes, it would be nice to sell two million copies <laughs> and have a summer home somewhere, but this isn't what we're really doing. We're not guided by profits. And right now, I think one of the real um, that you guys were pointing to, one of the real problems is single digit profits are no longer sufficient for newspapers. So I've seen in my hometown of Los Angeles, your Chicago Trib Company has wrecked, wrecked our newspaper because single digit profits were no good. My friend Steve Wasserman, the former book editor, left after he was told by his, the uh, publisher and editor came in, brought all their little editors in, and said, look, you guys think you're writing like the New York Times. You want to aspire to write like the New York Times. We're telling you our company wants you to write like USA Today. So you've kind of lost, something has been 
lost here. And also, again, the profits, the perspective, and the timing of the market critics seem to me a critical difference between the two today. Uh, unless someone has a burning need to respond to that, I'm going to ask for other questions so we can uh, get in as many as we can, if there are others. Yes? Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Do you like identify yourself, please. David Greenberg, Rutgers University. Uh, a couple of comments. One, as I'm sure all the panelists know, I sort of wanted to pick up on this idea that we are talking about earlier uh, of false balance as, as a guiding light of journalism. And I, I would suggest this probably emerged much earlier, kind of as soon as even the moment that objectivity itself became sort of an ideal of reporting. And, uh, I mean, you know, and there's a large literature on Joe McCarthy and the press. And this was precisely how McCarthy manipulated the press. He would sort of put out an outrageous story, yeah. and people would deny it, and you would get both accounts without really time or the capacity to investigate the truth of his claims, but he would kind of continue to, to maintain uh, the media spotlight. So this is something that is not just a failing of individual journalists today, but perhaps a kind of inherent occupational hazard of the aspiration to objectivity that we all tend to think is is valuable. doesn't mean it, it, it has to be so egregious as it is, it seems to be today. Um, then I also want to, on a similar point, ask about the this notion about consensual narratives persisting today, and particularly Rick's examples, both of the WMD in Iraq, turned out to be non-existent, and austerity. And, you know, I would challenge the notion that those were consensual narratives in the way that, say, anti-communism was. I mean, I read and, you know, a lot of columnists reporting, questioning, you know, whether that stuff was there. I read now lots of people besides Krugman who take a much more Keynesian perspective. I mean, you know, reporters uh, put this in there reporting for the good papers and the you know, may not maybe not so much in the broadcast sphere. I would say that the difference is those arguments, which I think we tend to support, that is a more Keynesian economic perspective, skepticism about the administration's claims on Iraq, didn't carry the day in the debates that were had, partly because the Democratic leadership in both cases embraced or capitulated, however you want to put it, to the Republican position. And so the journalists kind of taking the two parties as their proxies for the two sides of the debate would give less voice to the dissenting views because, you know, if Obama's talking austerity and the Republicans are talking austerity, the Keynesian view gets somewhat sidelined. But it's still very much there in the journalism. It's just not framed by our political leadership uh, as, as central. And so I think that distinction is important. It may not be a failure of journalists so much as a failure of our politicians to maintain that robust debate. Rick, did you want to comment? Yeah, on? I want to uh, talk about the, the McCarthy thing, actually. Um, what's m the difference between um, uh, the false balance that McCarthy did exploit uh, and the false balance now is um, where's our Edward R. Murrow? Uh, I'm talking about, again, in this tradition of morally self-confident elites who uh, almost by dint of the fact that they were so confident and so uh, secure in their sort of cultural position were able to kind of make a, uh, intervene in the public sphere and make a moral claim. And let, let me just um, give you an example of how, um, you know, Time wrote about the John Byrd Society in 1961 and how they wrote about Glenn Beck uh, when, they, when he was on the cover a couple of years ago. Um, uh, this is from March of 61 time. I love this. Among the U.S. Brotherhoods dedicated to the fight against communism, nothing is quite like the John Burke Society. Uh, its cells of 20, 30 members of peace take orders from society headquarters, promote communist-style front organizations that do not use the John Burke Society name, carefully avoiding normal channels of political action. Um, the society accepts the hard-boiled dictatorial direction of one man who sees democracy as a perennial fraud and estimates that the U.S. is 60% communist-controlled. Uh, in other times, the John Birch Americanists, as they, call, as they call themselves, might seem a tiresome comic opera joke, but already the society admits the cells in 35 states and its partisans have made their anonymous and unsettling presence felt in the scores of the U.S. communities. Nothing there that's 
that that's good reporting for one thing. That's how the that's how the John Birch Society works. But there also was that quote unquote editorializing. Now there was still editorializing when when Time Magazine wrote about Glenn Beck, but it looked very different. Um, they said um, uh, he was quote the hottest thing in the political rant racket, a gifted entrepreneur of angst, tireless, funny, self-deprecating, who has lit up the 5 p.m. slot in a way never thought possible by industry watchers. Right? What's missing is the moral confidence to kind of say, we are willing to risk uh, a, uh, a judgment. And you know, they, it, as reporting, it was terrible. They didn't, for example, report that uh, a big part of um, Glenn Beck's following, or not a big part, that Glenn Beck has a following and he supports something called Oath Keepers, where cops and uh, 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 military members sign an oath not to uh, you know, uh, not to carry out unconstitutional orders uh, when the, when Obama institutes martial law and that sort of thing. So we have something qualitatively different here, and uh, I would say, um, despite you know, you don't want to falsely lionize the consensus, which of course got us into Vietnam, um, but there's something there's something missing here that that we don't have, and I, I think we feel that loss profoundly uh, because our elites are very morally unaccountable, among other things, to each other these days. Michael? Um, the key thing, though, is nobody cares what Time Magazine thinks about Glenn Beck, <laughs> where they cared very much in 1961 what Time Magazine uh, thought about John Birch Society. And you know, other people um, were exposing you know, Beck, um, mostly websites, certainly. But um, I mean, just a very short you know, uh, anecdote about that, uh, Politico um, asked me and some other historians to evaluate Glenn Beck's view of history. And they wrote a long article about it, which made very clear, they, they, they tried to get some balance too, asking some conservative, even, even conservative historians are not gonna defend Glenn Beck. Um, and, uh, and it was a pretty, and Politico is not my idea of the next New York Times, believe me. <laughs> but but uh, you know, they had a certain sense that uh, this guy is a fraud and someone has to, uh, has to say that. And of course they didn't do it in their own, in their own voice uh, of authority, uh, such as it is. They did it in the voice of, of people like me who were as, uh, assumed to be uh, authorities by history. But was, nevertheless, the, the piece as a whole was, I think, pretty damning. So um, again, maybe this sort of, uh, again, I'm trying to be the anti-nostalgic here, but, but um, you know, I do think that the fact that Beck went up and went down, you know, perhaps not unlike McCarthy, of course, McCarthy had much more power, um, is a, a lesson that uh, people do learn. Uh, through one media or another. Other questions? Yes. Here. Um, I, I thought it was really refreshing to hear a conversation about journalism that used words like balance and authority and consensus. Uh, but none of you used the F word. And by that I mean Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> and talking about a journalism that is agenda driven, distorted, and highly partisan. And I wonder where that fits in, not just in a sort of historical term, but, but actually a lot of the, the power of Fox News is creating a history. And I just want you all to talk about the F word for a minute. Let me uh, make, turn it also into a question about the M word and, and ask Alan. So is Rupert Murdoch our loose? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, a lot of people have has said that to me, uh, and uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I mean, they do have uh, similar uh, a similarity in that they both have had a big empire, uh, although Rupert Murdoch's empire is hugely larger than Luce's ever was. Um, but uh, I, I don't think. Uh, Mur Murdoch, although he, I'm sure he has a uh, political view, that's not really important to him. Uh, and it, it's, it's really uh, just a money-making institution. Uh, and the fact that it's uh, generally conservative and, um, and sensational, uh, it's mostly because th that makes money. Uh, so I, I, think, I think Murdoch is, um, is not like Luce. I mean, I think Luce had a vision. Uh, I think Murdoch had a uh, had a company. Let me include Roger Ailes in this and mm -hmm. see whether anyone on the panel wants to take up the question. Uh, I want to I want to uh, uh, steal a march on, on my friend Mike over there and be the anti-nostalgic this time. <laughs> uh, my M word is McCormick. 
here we are in the shadow of the, the Tribune Tower. Uh, this gentleman, Robert McCormick, in a lot of respects was a fascist. He was the publisher of the Chicago Tribune. Uh, uh, referred to uh, Franklin Roosevelt as a dictator with regularity, uh, tried to keep America from getting into World War II, and um, he wasn't around then, but his influence certainly was felt. And you know, basically, when Martin Luther King uh, died, said he had it coming because he told people they didn't have to follow the law. Uh, and uh, the Chicago Tribune, in a lot of respects, was as powerful as uh, Fox News in that it was the newspaper of the Midwest. It was the New York Times of uh, massive uh, parts of uh, the United States. So um, it was always thus. We've always had kind of reactionary uh, publishers uh, acting in the interests of um, the 1%. And um, uh, it, I think that uh, it's easy to forget how um, you know, hard it is to create political progress in America. There are always forces uh, arrayed against it. A last quick question in the back. Yes, sir. Gary Gerstle, and I think this is um, mostly for Jackson and Michael, but maybe for Rick and, and Alan too. And, and, uh, but both of you spent a lot of time every week editing a small journal. And I wanted you to reflect directly on that as an element of American journalism. Uh, the role of small journals has had a long and distinguished career in American journalism. Our conception of journalism is of the big mainstream institutions, but over the course of American history, small journals have had a very important role to play. And I would like to hear what you think about your role in that process, both where you stand in that longer tradition, uh, and also the way in which the media revolutions of our own time are um, affecting the role of the small journal. And I think I would like to ask you to reflect on this, not simply from the left, which is your own experience, but the example of William Buckley on the right. It, it's a tall order because each has a maximum of two minutes to do it. So oh, let me. <laughs> but the small journal and its place in the larger story we're talking about. Thank you for that setup, <laughs> uh, Garrett. No, I, 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 uh, I actually did have a, a, a few notes written about the margins and where the margins <laughs> even are. Uh, these days, uh, given the uh, diffuse and pervasive influence of, of the internet, uh, which doesn't feel like a margin and yet uh, in, in some ways bears a marginal relationship to what we've been talking about as these consensus narratives, which I agree are produced as much by politicians and policymakers as by journalists. Uh, I, I inherited the journal uh, that I edit from, from Dick Poirier, who was primarily a literary critic, and I've been trying to steer it more toward history and politics. Every issue uh, has a couple of uh, topical pieces. Uh, the current issue has a piece by my colleague Toby Jones on Saudi Arabia versus the Arab Spring, which I I uh, want you all to know will be available online on our new improved website. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the name of the journal is Raritan. Uh, yes, because I, I didn't bring my copy. Sorry. Uh, but it, this, this is very, uh, no, this is very important to me, and it's one reason that I, that I did take on the job, is that I did uh, view the journal as a, an instrument and a vehicle for intervention in public discourse in the, in the largest sense of the word, and that includes uh, literature and the arts as well as, uh, continues to include literature and the arts as well as politics. We do have the problem that, that Steve alluded to, which is that we're a quarterly, uh, and we can, I, I can write a topical editor's note, or Toby Jones can write a topical piece about Saudi Arabia and the Arab Spring, uh, and two months later it will have been overtaken by events, and we have to do a, you know, we, get, we have to get on the phone and say, sweetheart, get me a rewrite. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, you can't always get rewrite in time. Uh, so the, the pace of, of change uh, is, is sometimes outruns the quarterly. Nevertheless, I think there's a place for, uh, for quarterlies or percent comes out a little more often than quarterly. No, it's quarterly. Uh, it is quarterly. Okay. It's reflection. It's what I like to talk about as, as reflection, stepping back a little. Uh, 
uh, just just as there's a place for for magazines like my friend Joel Blythe's is in these times, which is published right here in Chicago and uh, uh, appears a little more often than quarterly, and is uh, astonishing to me uh, that that anyone can do that and still have a life. Uh, but it is it is a uh, a great uh, uh, challenge, I think, uh, because I do think there's a great tradition of, of uh, small presses you know, little magazines, as they're dismissively called, uh, that have had big impacts. And of course, everyone thinks about uh, the golden moment of partisan review in the late 30s and the early 40s. Uh, I don't want to recreate uh, partisan review just as I don't want to recreate Dick Poirier's Raritan. Uh, they're both tough acts to follow, so you have to come up with a different act. Uh, but that's what I'm trying to do, and that's another thing that actually gets me out of bed in the morning. Knowing that there's more to say, I just want to ask Michael to have a chance to. Yeah, and I want to let Alan have the last word because uh, he should have the last word here, um, if he wants to have it. <laughs> um, so I'll be I'll be as quick as I can. First of all, I'm co-editor of Dissent with the really very great uh, political theorist and activist uh, and uh, uh, political philosopher Michael Waldron. Um, so uh, I don't I don't get out of bed all by myself, so to speak. <laughs> um, and. Uh, you know, it's a little different. The history of dissent, is, as many of you out there know, was, was it was always a political magazine, you know, first and foremost. It was founded in 1954 as a socialist magazine, and we still are part of what you might call the social democratic tradition, um, and uh, by Irving Howe and Lou Kozer. Um, and the first issue, very characteristically, they said, what, what is socialism? <laughs> they put a question mark on it, and, and they kept trying to figure out that uh, for many years. Um, you know, I think the Gary's uh, comparison to National Review is very interesting. I hadn't really thought about that. Uh, but you know, National Review, of course, first of all, had a lot of money at the beginning, <laughs> which always helps, uh, since Buffy's family uh, was, has oil money. Um, but also, I think um, it was a magazine, uh, and Rick knows a lot about this, uh, for kind of inchoate you know, group of people out there who, um, who really felt that the consensus was a liberal consensus in Time and Newsweek and and other uh, high circulation magazines uh, were not um, speaking for them. In fact, they opposed almost everything that appeared in those, in those magazines. So they wanted to break the consensus just as much as the left wanted to break the consensus uh, a few years later. Um, and, uh, and so I think that gave National Review a lot of its uh, excitement. Uh, and of course, they got some very good writers at the time uh, uh, to write for them, um, a lot of former leftists. Uh, um, among others, including the guy who wrote uh, many of the best scripts for the Marx Brothers, who have become a conservative, for example. I mean, it, w it was funny, it was humorous. Um, something which uh, Dissent uh, has never been accused of being, of course. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so what I think about what we try to do, um, again, uh, in 30 seconds or so, I just say on television, 30 seconds, that's it, um, is, is uh, to uh, provide people on the broad left in America with uh, reflections, as to use Jackson's word, uh, ways to think about uh, what's going on in the country and the world um, in a way that's not possible uh, in a weekly magazine, in a way that's not possible um, uh, online, um, and uh, to do it with, I hope, some, uh, uh, some style uh, of prose um, and some sense that things are complex and yet there are still uh, a morality, political morality, political decency, if to use Michael Walzer's terms, that uh, needs to be preserved. But I should also say we have a great, we a great website uh, updated <laughs> daily, <laughs> uh, dissentmagazine.org, which um, is beginning to be, you know, uh, as important and certainly more popular than uh, the quarterly. So we are, we are, we are uh, five toes and maybe uh, a couple toenails into that into that uh, new world as well. Great, thank you. Um, uh, I will give uh, Alan the last word, and uh, you can either answer this question or, or not, as you choose. Uh, at, at a certain point in the book, you quote Henry Luce as uh, saying in a mission statement that we will, the news magazine will justify journalism in our time. Do you think that project of justifying journalism in our time is a project that exists now? Well, I, th I think uh, Luce had a vision of justifying uh, journalism in his time by thinking of his own uh, company. Uh, I, I think um, if, if we think about today, 
Uh, I don't think there's any one person or one institution uh, that justifies journalism in our time, but I think there, I think journalism is certainly justified in our time. Uh, what, I, the one th what I wanted to, to say at, at the end here, first of all, is to thank everybody for uh, participating in this event, um, but also to just s say a word about the, the connection between journalism and history. Uh, and I think this panel, everyone on this panel, in one way or another, uh, has a foot in both of these in both of these sides. Uh, that uh, everybody in this on this panel is is in some ways connected to journalism uh, as well as being historians. And I think there are great historians uh, who were not academic scholars. Um, and um, uh, and I think we, you know we we would be impoverished uh, if that were not the case. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is a lot of uh, journalistic history uh, that is uh, ridiculous. <laughs> uh, Bill O'Reilly's uh, book on uh, Lincoln, which is the <laughs> number one uh, bestseller, uh, at least in the last time I saw, um, and it's, uh, it's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> it, it's as ridiculous as Glenn Beck, actually, almost. Um, so, uh, but of course there are also journalists who write uh, terrible history as well. <laughs> so uh, I think, uh, I think the, the, uh, the connection between journalism and history uh, strengthens both of the both things. And uh, I, I really appreciate all the people who came today and, and uh, our colleagues here at the, on the panel. Thank you. We've talked a lot about consensus today. Please join me in expressing a consensus of appreciation to Alan and our panelists. <laughs>